Kathy Wood from ARK Invest was just interviewed by tech futurist Peter Diamandis. Kathy shares more about her robotaxi projections, but they also say Tesla is the unsung hero of the decade ahead. We'll watch that video today. And as Tesla stock goes for nine straight gains, Tesla is back as part of the Magnificent Seven. But at the same time, short positions have just climbed to their highest since 2021 at 3.8% of shares at 31 billion shares shorted. Today, we'll also watch what Tesla bear Tony Sakanagi and what Tesla bull Keith Fitzgerald is saying. Finally, Elon also commented on Korean Tesla shareholders now that both Model Y and 3 are the best selling cars there. So I've got Hans Nelson joining us. He's got a great YouTube channel. Check him out there at Hans C. Nelson. Welcome, Hans. Thanks for having me, Herbert. You've been doing fantastic interviews lately. You've been uh, bringing on board some experts in Europe. And then you and uh, Far uh, uh, Farzad have been doing <laughs> just great. The Neuralink uh, video was great. You're doing just fun, fun, fun videos. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. So let's talk Tesla stock. And we're going to watch three different videos from different analysts out there. And Kathy Wood is the main one that we'll, uh, we'll cover. So first, it's, it's fun to see that Tesla stock is now back considered as Magnificent 7 because of the nine straight gains. Uh, do you know much about this? And, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, having been down on the stock until just the past few days, sentiment has been pretty negative on Tesla this year from a lot of people, including a lot of people who are bulls and who have, you know, significant positions. And so it's just great to see the momentum kind of turning back in favor of Tesla. You know, if you want to be a long term holder, you've got to be able to stomach the ups and the downs of being invested, especially in a story stock like Tesla that has been, you know, historically very volatile, which means volatile when things are going well, like we've seen the past few weeks, um, but then also volatile when things are not going well. And it's great to see the recognition of Tesla as, you know, one of the premier tech companies in the world. And that's really the Magnificent Seven to me. That's what the significance of that is. And I am excited to just see the continued execution of Tesla on full self-driving. Um, Man, the early indications that we've got for 12.3.4 are very strong. And they, you know, while it is taking a little bit of extra time, I think that the post by um, Ashok earlier this year, I ran across it yesterday and it, it feels so timely that this is the beginning of the end still, mm -hmm. that we've we've got some challenges still to work out with how do we do full-scale mass deployment development of these full end-to-end -end neural networks. And I think that's the hiccups that we're seeing right now um, with trying to get 12.4 into the hands of as many customers as possible. But those are engineering challenges that we're figuring out. And the underlying architecture of having these full neural nets, that is the solution that's going to get us to the prize of robo-taxis. And it's just exciting to see them continuing to iterate understanding the nuances of how to make it work and what the challenges really are and what the timelines are going to be. Um, but I think that given the success of so many other areas of AI over the last couple of years, the market is really starting to realize the significance of what Tesla is doing with these LLMs, or sorry, not with L with these full end-to-end -end neural networks that allow them to do in full self driving what LLMs have done in other areas. And, um, you know, I think that's why we're starting to see the sentiment shift, you know, combined obviously with the, the removal of the overhang of Elon's compensation package uh, as well. Yeah, this is great. So we're, we, you and I will do another show, of deeper dive on the RoboTaxi, on the FSD. Uh, we're going to James Dalma comments on that. But right now we're talking about the stock and being back to Mag 7. Some people are saying we can see Tesla become a Mag 1 and... You know, it's interesting that as they we're back in that space, you know, there's people who think it's going to fall. We'll talk about the shorts going up, and then we've got people who are really bulls. And so let's start with the bulls. You've got um, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest. Of course, she wrote up this incredible projections for Tesla's RoboTaxi. Uh, Elon himself twice 
said in the uh, annual shareholder meeting, I really like her analysis the most. Peter Diamandis, who's a tech futurist, in, 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 interviewed her. So let's watch that clip. And uh, love the research, which is on uh, Tesla's robo-taxis. Um, we have an announcement coming up shortly, uh, but a lot of news there. Uh, uh, talk to us about what's coming, what the implications are, because it's huge. It is huge, uh, and there are so many doubters. It's 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 very interesting. I think the most important, one of the most important pieces of work. Um, I'm not sure if I shared it with you, although it is in uh, Big Ideas, is the safety work uh, mm -hmm. that I saw. That, I saw the graphs in Big Ideas, and again, by the way, where do people go to download the Big Ideas uh, yes, document? It's arc-invest.com. Yeah. Uh, and in there, you will see a, a chart showing the safety of, uh, of a cruise automation car, a Waymo car, the average car in the U.S., a Tesla car before FSD, and a Tesla car after F FSD. Uh, I'll just give two of those. The average car on the road in the U.S. has an accident every 200,000 miles. The, the average car with old FSD, think six months ago, uh, has an accident every 3.2 million miles. 200 to 3. You know, Volvo built uh, uh, its brand, yeah, brand. And its business yeah. on safety. Uh, I, yeah. think, I think Tesla, I think we're, we're trying to tell this story, but that Tesla should be using this. Um, uh, so... Uh, we, we believe that uh, with unboxed manufacturing, with this August 8th announcement, uh, Elon has been sending messages to his employee base, his supplier base, uh, to the extent he has not verticalized, and, and to uh, ultimate consumers that we're getting very close to the uh, days of a robo-taxi uh, driving us from point A to point B. Uh, safely, quickly, and and cheaply, inexpensively. So, uh, um, as you know, uh, we did we've we've put out our model, and the last year uh, we assumed that our price target uh, that that two thirds of it would be due to robo taxi. Our confidence that robo taxi is going to launch within the next eighteen months maybe two years, is very high, so much so that you'll also see in the Tesla report that we put out, that you can find at the same site, um, that we, uh, we would be shocked if it isn't within two years. There's, you know, the probability of later, we think, has diminished uh, significantly. Given the breakthroughs in AI, how quickly Tesla is harnessing them, how much data it is continuing to collect. And, you know, Tesla said, uh, or Elon said in his shareholder during the shareholders meeting recently, that um, the, 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 the disengagements are happening so rarely now uh, with full self-driving that he's worried about boredom you know, of the, the humans who are overseeing this. They're not, they're not finding disengagement. So they are getting very close. Uh, unbox manufacturing means they will be manufacturing both human-driven cars and robo-taxis in the same facility, no more assembly line, completely, uh, you know, new first principles thinking. And they'll toggle between them based on demand. So we, we are getting close. And we also think we'll learn more about Master Plan 4 on October 8th. Might be wrong on that, but, uh, you know, because he didn't put out Master Plan 3 more than maybe a year or a year and a half ago. So, but that's how quickly the world you know, is changing. Okay, pause it there. Wow, that's great. Uh, she went through a number of things. I didn't know a few things she said. What's, uh, what was your interpretation of what you heard? Yeah, I mean, part of this is stuff that we have heard from Kathy before, but it is just good to reflect back and think about those first principles things. I would definitely agree with her that we are, and you know, this reflects the comments I was making earlier, that I don't know if we're within six months of solving essentially level five autonomous functionality. Probably not based on how fast we're seeing 12.4 roll out. Um, 
But I think that that two year time frame that she's talking about is very reasonable. I don't know that I would have 90% confidence of two years, um, but I would definitely have high confidence, maybe 70, 75% confidence that it lands within that time frame. And if you think that that's, you know, even if you say, okay, go out to three years and now you're 90% or 95%, that is still a time scale on which there are no other competitors in the world who can ramp up the amount of manufacturing capacity to produce these vehicles at a low enough price to really have any sort of competitive threat to Tesla. And it means that the market share opportunity for Tesla to capture is massive. And um, I think that's the thing that most people just are not fully appreciating is that there's no one else right now who is really in a strong position to be able to take this autonomous rideshare market away from Tesla. They are far, far, far ahead in the lead pull position of the mass market opportunity of this technology. That regardless of how good Waymo can be in San Francisco, they do not have a business model that is capable of scaling to millions and millions of vehicles all across the United States and Europe and you know these large developed markets um, quickly enough to have any sort of defensive moat against Tesla. Thank you, Hans. Tomorrow, like I keep referencing, but you and I are going to do another video. We'll publish it tomorrow morning. We're going to dive deeper into the economics of Waymo versus Tesla and what Xiaopeng is doing with their LiDAR or no more LiDAR and what they're, what they're doing. So we'll do that. Let's finish off the conversation between um, Kathy. They start getting a little bit more about uh, what they think about Tesla here. So let's listen to that. I, I think, I mean, Tesla for me is, is, the, is the unsung hero of the decade ahead. And so your position there is fully validated in my brain. Um, and it comes from uh, the work they're doing, obviously, in their in their vehicles and their lower price vehicles. And really, I mean, they're going to decimate internal combustion engine cars. It's just going to be cheaper, faster, better, higher performance vehicles, and been, period. And yeah, sorry. It's been again, I've watched uh, the traditional auto manufacturers. They've rallied in here. Why? Because they're pulling back on electric. They're pulling back on autonomous and the mar and they're raising dividends and increasing share repurchases. That's just more nails yeah. in the coffin. They're, if you ask they're manipulate. It's, it's manipulation in the wrong direction. But what's coming on top of that, of course, is uh, Tesla is an energy company. Uh, Tesla, Tesla is an AI company. Tesla is a humanoid robot company. Tesla is a replacement for Uber. Um, and all of these things, any one of them uh, can, can double, triple, you know, get close to 10xing the valuation of the company. Uh, so um, the question you have to ask yourself is, can, will Elon fall this time? Will he not be able to perform? And uh, I think the, the recent, you know, uh, pay package he received, um, or at least received validation of, uh, is all the motivation he needed to, to push through. And, and, and he will be, we talked about this last time, and it's now even more evident, he will become the first trillionaire, uh, hands down, period. Uh, um, we, and I don't we think would, that's very far away. Yeah, we would uh, absolutely, we would not be surprised. Uh, Tesla alone, yeah. and in our model, we don't include much for Optimus. We just assume that Optimus becomes, uh, you know, a, a huge productivity booster within the Tesla organization. We're not assuming any outside sales at all. So, you know, that's a call option. Uh, energy storage uh, we, is is much more of a call option for us. He, uh, uh, Elon thinks it can be as big or bigger than autonomous. We would find that hard to believe uh, because we think auto the autonomous opportunity, eight to $10 trillion, this is for the entire ecosystem, not just Tesla, in revenue generation. This is including China. And of course, Tesla is now going to be participating in this space in China. Um, eight to $10 that was trillion. A coup. Okay. Yeah, it is. Some people say, you know, we're, we're debating this ourselves. Uh, you know, is, did China invite them in because China wants to reverse engineer what they're doing because Baidu and Apollo are not uh, are not up to snuff yet? Or are they uh, letting 
uh, Tesla partner with Baidu for, you know, for mapping reasons. I, you know, there's there's a big divide there. I tend to I tend to think China wants to be first on robo taxis, meaning more ubiquitous robo taxis, uh, and they want to learn more from Tesla, just like they did yeah. with EVs. You know, speaking of this, let's not forget. Um, China is developing their own humanoid robot, robots as well. We've seen Unitree there, which was uh, announced at $16,000 price tag. Uh, the the uh, tariff doubled it to 32000 and then Elon came out at 10000 I found that within, you know, a month of it, a month of the announcements, fascinating. Uh, but uh, it's moving fast. And again, we have to realize all of this is riding on top of the AI wave. Right. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, All right. So that was fun. <laughs> Any comments on what you heard? I mean, yeah, so many points that they hit on that I I really appreciate. And the I'll start with energy and just say that I, you know, I think that Arc is kind of underestimating that side of the business right now. You know, between finally seeing the growth and deployments this past quarter that we've kind of been waiting around for for a while. Um, that really shows that the the market really is there for these mega packs to be deployed at scale, that it is kind of a long, slow process for a lot of the customers that are bringing these in and connecting them to their grids, but that once this ramp really gets going, that, yeah, we'll have lots more factories that we need to set up like Lathrop to supply all of this demand and then, you know, just like there was a lot of excitement, uh, I don't know what, 18 months ago from people like JP Sartre on um, X and there was that zero hedge guy that um, I think he was, yeah, honestly, I think he was a con man. Um, but besides him, there was a lot of other legitimate people with a lot of excitement and they modeled out the revenue earnings potential for mega packs and you know they were beating the drum that it's much 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 higher than most people expected and then we heard zach kirkhorn say that well our target is going to be 25 percent margins um but based on you know the conversation that you know larry was having with matt last week it looks like they have been you know they're finally able to fully recognize some of this deferred revenue that's been out there that as they do that, that those margins are going to creep up well in excess of 25%. And if that's the case, it has a dramatic impact on the bottom line because these sales are so large as far as the, you know, the dollar amount of these contracts. And um, so I think that that has a, a good potential to provide a lot of earnings growth for Tesla that maybe isn't as much as the robo-taxi opportunity over a five to 10 year time horizon, but it definitely is, you know, in excess of just the pure automotive market for the time being. And we don't know what that's going to grow to in the long run. Um, and if you couple that with Optimus, which I, I think it's, um, mm -hmm. it, it's silly not to view Optimus as, as big, if not a bigger, opportunity for Tesla than robo taxis. So um, I don't know how much of right now, like, I don't think that ARC honestly believes that it's not bigger, but I think that they're not ready to, they haven't done all of the research and stuff. Like right now, what they're focused on is trying to evangelize the potential of robo taxis and they're doing a good job and so that's what they're focused on so they're not saying that these other things can't be they're just saying that if you if we're looking at the robo taxi business let's not think about these other opportunities as you know something that competes with the robo taxis um and so overall I, you know i i really appreciate the work that she's done on modeling out the potential for the robo taxi service and um you know i would definitely agree with their their assessments and then on the china point i think that you know the ccp is very strategic in the way that they set up markets and the way that they use competition in order to drive strategic outcomes and i believe that the reason that they are allowing tesla who has you know a wholly owned 
foreign entity operating inside of China to go ahead and bring this technology to the Chinese market, at least for the time being, is because they want the competitive pressure that Tesla brings when they execute on that technology to be operating inside of their competitive markets so that their own Chinese companies have to deal with that and have to increase their level of competitiveness and their fitness so that then they can commercialize that technology over time. And, and I believe that, you know, long-term, the biggest competitors to Tesla on the global robo-taxi stage are going to be Chinese competitors. Now, who that's going to be, hard to say at this point in time. It looks like other than Chaopeng, you know, there are not a whole lot of companies that are pursuing what we view as the correct strategy. Um, but, you know, that can change very quickly. And obviously, technology can diffuse rapidly among a very large number of Chinese companies all at the same time. By whatever mechanism that operates, I don't know. Um, but yeah, we could see a number of competitors once the understanding of how that technology really works comes online in China, that um, you'll see quite a few companies that are moving rapidly in that direction. I like everything you said. I agree with everything you said. I think ARK Invest, um, they're downplaying energy and they're downplaying bots, but that's because they're focusing on robo-taxi for now. Um, I'd, otherwise, I wouldn't agree with what she was saying about energy. Not, not you know, She doesn't see how it could become as big as the auto. I think that one's very clear for me because of the AI growth and data center requirement and so forth. And then bots, very clear to me that that's going to be bigger than autonomy. Um, but okay, so that was, you know, two bowls, right? The, the Amandas who likes Elon, you've got uh, ARK Invest. Let's listen to a bear now. So we've got uh, Tony Sakanagi, who Bernstein analyst, and he says that we believe autonomy is a ways out. We don't believe that Tesla will uniquely solve that problem. Waymo's been working at this. They've been doing trials since 2012 on self-driving. Tesla's not done any public trials. I don't know. That's kind of silly, but that's what he says. So let's listen in to what he's saying. Our future estimates and accordingly our price target. But but at this point, um, we don't we don't see that. We believe that autonomy is a ways out, and we don't believe that Tesla will uniquely solve that problem. Uh, Waymo has been working at this. They've been doing trials since 2012 on self-driving. Tesla has do not done any public trials. Uh, not to say that Tesla won't do well in self full self-driving. It's just not um, not something that it necessarily will be able to exclusively do. And you have to almost believe that to get to the, type, the types of valuations that uh, Tesla stock uh, is. Okay, so, so first of all, we know Tony, we've been following him and he's been wrong for years. It's a just, long time. It's just crazy that he continues to do this, a bear for so long. And every time he says something, it never pans out what he's saying. Two, um, Waymo is there. And they're not, nobody's saying that Tesla's going to be exclusive, but it's about how, how much market can Waymo do? Could Waymo, could Waymo make 100,000 cars? Can they make a million cars? They don't have any just because they've got, a, you know, they think that yep. they're ahead and doing public trials. That doesn't mean anything. Who is doing the most public trials? <laughs> well, Tesla. I mean, it depends on how you define, like, if yeah. you want to gerrymander your definitions, <laughs> Sure, you can say that Waymo is the only one doing public trials. Yes, they're the only public, you, them and Cruz um, here in the United States are the only public trials of driverless robo taxis at this point in time. But, you know, what Tony obviously fails to understand is two very basic things. They're called economics and scaling. And if Tesla's solution is going to be five to 10 times cheaper than Waymo's solution, and it's five to 10 times easier to get a million Teslas on the road operating as robo taxis once they fully solve the intelligence piece, then obviously that is going to outcompete the Waymo solution. Yes, the Waymo solution will exist in the marketplace. No one's saying that it won't, but are consumers going to choose that if it's more expensive and it's harder to find one? No, that is the argument that Tesla bulls are making and that Tony seems to fail to understand. In the meantime, though, we do have a lot of shorts jumping on board. And this one's uh, confused me a little bit, Hans. You can tell me what you're thinking. But, you know, we had a lot of shorts. It's not material, honestly, anymore. But 
um, a lot of the shorts got burned in the last several days here in the last two weeks. But now the news is that there's the short positions have just climbed even higher since 2021. It's their highest since 2021, 3.8% of the float, despite all these shorts being burned, $31 billion worth of shares shorted has happened. Uh, what's your thoughts on what happened there? Um, so, I mean, part of that, it, it's hard for me to understand how those numbers are shaped without getting a little bit more data. Like, is that just that, you know, the val the market cap of the company has grown. So obviously the, if we have the same number of shares shorted today that were shorted, you know, four weeks ago, the value of those shares shorted is going to be dramatically increased. Um, so are we getting new shares shorted or are we just growing in the value that's being shorted? It, it's a little bit hard for me to say just based yeah. on the data that we have, but one of the dynamics that I would suspect is going on is that there were some shares that were shorted before and that those shares ended up having, you know, as we've squeezed up that those shares probably had to be covered and that contributed to a larger squeeze upward and that the larger the squeeze upward went, the more yeah. we had new people coming in to short at the higher and higher levels because they believe that this is a bubble and that this is not a justified move in the stock price. And then we'll just have to see who's right and who's yeah. wrong, but we know what happens to, you know, shorts over the long term in Tesla yeah. has not been pretty. It's dangerous when 88 is about to come. Maybe the sentiment gets even more frenzy. And of course, afterwards, it might fall. But okay, you've got another uh, bull here, Keith, Keith Fitzgerald, um, money market something. Uh, the stock is going double or triple, maybe even more in the next few years. We're early innings. Let's listen to Keith. Mention as well, you're still bullish on Tesla, thinking this could be a $300 stock uh, next year. Yes, I am. I think this stock is going to double or triple, maybe even more in the next few years. And again, we're early innings. Anybody who's thinking about this just in terms of cars is very smart, but I would encourage them to broaden their horizons significantly. This is about power. This is about robotics. I think it perhaps is the best undervalued AI play on the planet right now. And love him or hate him, Musk knows what he's doing. All right. Keith, thank he's not you. the we only one. It. Always fun to check in. Keith. That's been saying that um, Dan Ives also calls Tesla the most undervalued AI play. But even if you look at the cars, here's Tesla just sent this out. They showed a semi with all of the Tesla's uh, vehicles out there, basically showing that we're almost at the level of hitting every single segment. Of course, the lower affordable vehicles will still come. The robo taxi will be coming. Um, you got to get that roadster, van. That yep. van. But it doesn't matter. The point is like, look, yep. we're, we got a semi. <laughs> Here's a semi towing four Teslas. Um, I thought that was kind of fun. And then uh, what do we have here? And then you've got, uh, boom. Oh, I don't have that video. I thought I did. So, but Elon replied to that. Tesla has a semi. <laughs> and in the meantime, in Korea, Tesla is the number one stock held by Koreans today. Elon replied saying smart people. Any thoughts on that? I I can't disagree with him. I you know it should be obvious. I this is one of the you know most held stocks probably in the United States by retail as well. Um, but Korea also has a very high penetration of Model Three and Model Y sales. I think they just understand this EV transition better than we do domestically here in the United States, and their investment portfolios reflect that. And I think that you know over the long term they will be rewarded. Yeah. So actually, it, it, you're correct. It looked like we just hit a milestone, both Tesla Model Y and 3. Tesla Model Y is the best-selling electric car in Korea now as of the first half of 2024. And second place is the Model 3. Even though they were all imported cars, they showed tremendous sales performance. Winning the hearts of Koreans is not easy, but Tesla was able to achieve it because it offers good products. And then this move, he thinks, Tesla Chan, the second half of the year. Here's this, the data to show this. Model Y, 10,000 units. Model 3, 7,000 units. Then you got the others here um, falling behind them. So, And just remember that, you know, Japan is a market that Tesla has not had good penetration in. And, you know, I think a big reason for that is just domestic loyalty by the Japanese to their own car companies, which you know, is very understandable. But Korea is also, you know, a very strong automotive manufacturing uh, nation and Kia Hyundai are major uh, employers in the region. 
uh, a major source of Korean pride. And so for Koreans to be adopting Teslas that are imported foreign vehicles, I think that says a lot about the quality of the vehicles. One last point data point I wanted to share here was right down below here. The Tesla Model Y surpassed the sales of luxury brands Mercedes-Benz and BMW in Korea first half of 2024, shaking up the structure of the top selling car brands. Usually it's Mercedes and BMW were the top of the market in South Korea. Audi and Volkswagen round out the big four imported car brands. So, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, very rich people and they want to look good and it's no longer Mercedes and BMW. It's Tesla. It's now the new um, showcase. Thank you so much, Hans. That was great. We covered quite a bit here. Uh, we had bulls and bears talking and it was great to listen to Kathy Wood. Appreciate you, Hans. Follow him on his YouTube channel at Hans C. Nelson. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.